It is no secret that being a dad can be one of the most challenging, yet the most rewarding experiences in life. As fathers, we are tasked with providing emotional support, guidance, discipline, financial support, all while working on balancing our own personal, professional, spiritual, and emotional lives. So what does it take to become a legendary dad? Larry Hagner, the founder of the Dad Edge, joins me today in this episode with his insight on how you can turn your journey into one where you are living a legendary life, a life with a legendary marriage, epic connection to your kids, managing your finances, optimizing your health, and becoming truly the leader you were meant to be. My conversation with Larry Hagner starts right now. Hello, my friend. Welcome to this episode of the Dads Making a Difference podcast. My name is Cam Hall. I am your host and founder of the Dads Making a Difference Mastermind Group. You will be presented at some point in time with a decision, with a choice, where you will need to make a decision to go one way or another, where you will be presented with an opportunity to take a risk, be uncomfortable and move forward, or to stay safe, to stay comfortable, and to be stuck. And the trick to those choices and those decisions is that we don't really know which way it's going to go, but we have to trust in our own experiences. We have to trust in our own context. We have to trust in the people around us. We have to trust God that we are going to make the right choice. And we need to look to others for guidance for those. My guest today is Larry Hagner. For many of us, myself included, Larry needs no introduction because If you, over the last eight years, have sought out resources and information online about fatherhood and being a better husband, being a better business owner and leader, you will have come across some of Larry's work. In 2015, Larry started the Good Dad Project, which quickly morphed into the Dad Edge. Larry is host of the Dad Edge podcast. Larry is on a mission to help you live in a legendary life, a legendary life. A life where you have a legendary marriage, where you have strong connections with your kids, where you are managing your personal finances, optimizing your health, and where you are becoming the leader you were meant to be for your family. Larry does this alongside his wife, Jessica. They've been married for almost 20 years. He is a father to four amazing young boys. And Larry shares in our conversation today how he was presented with choices, with opportunities, with confrontations, with problems, times where he says, quote, he fell on his face, but he had to make a choice. He had to go one way or had to go another way. And he's going to share how the people around him have inspired him to make the right choice. Even if it was against his gut, the people around him spoke into his life and he trusted God that that was the right choice. And now he has created something amazing. The dad edge is legendary. It is amazing. The Dad Edge serves thousands of men. The community of the Dad Edge is over 100,000 men across multiple platforms. And the Mastermind has almost 1,000 members. Larry is on a mission. I'm excited for you to hear this conversation with Larry Hagner. I get to learn something about Larry. I get to learn that we've had the same mentor, the same connection, the same group that has inspired us in our own journeys to follow a similar path, to start a group focused on helping men become stronger, more impactful, legendary men. Let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Larry Hagner. Larry, welcome to the Dads Making Difference podcast, brother. Excited to have you on today. Thanks for uh, making some time this morning. Man, I'm excited to be here, dude. I uh, I, I got to admit, though, I'm, I'm a little intimidated, Cam. Like, dude, I've seen, I've seen you online, man. Like I just, I, I, and the story I tell myself is Cam probably doesn't have a washing machine. He just like, just, you know, all the stains that are on his kids, like shirts and pants. Like, yeah, I'm just going to wash right here in the abs. I wish. Yeah. One, once upon a time, you know, now I'm, I'm not embracing the dad bod. Uh, You would know that, Um, but man, I'm embracing being 42 years old and being healthy and active with my kids. And it's amazing how our, 
lives transition and we start to focus on some different things. But uh, I appreciate you saying that. It's it's good to have you here. We were we were actually chatting about you brought up kids. We're chatting before we recorded that. Hey, my office door might open. We might have some visitors. So if you're listening to this right now and you hear a couple things in the background, hey, we're dads. This is real. This is how it happens, and we're just excited to connect today. Larry, there's guys. I'm I'm gonna go out there and say that uh, the guys listening to the Dads Making a Difference podcast right now know who you are. They, you have been in this space for a long time. You have been such an impact on the lives of so many men. You and your team with the Dad Edge, back with the Good Dad Project. You know, a lot of men who have been seeking resources and help and support in various areas of their life would know your name. But I think it's best that. You share who you are. You start with a little bit of your story, just so we can paint a picture of our conversation today. So, Larry, why don't you take a few moments and just tell us a little about about you? Well, thanks, man. I was actually referred to by another podcast interview that I was on as as one of the OGs. I'm like, wow. I was like, I'm one of the OGs. I was like, that's kind of crazy to even think about because I I don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. I started listening to podcasts in like 2009, so like I actually thought in 2015. I actually, when I started the Good Dad Project podcast, I was like, man, I'm, I'm like late to the game. Like I should have started this like five years ago, but you're right. I don't even know how many, you know, podcasts are even out there now. Um, but I know everybody, you know, over the years have, has wanted to start one and the majority of them don't make it, you know, people just get what's called. I, I was introduced to another term called pod burn oh, that man. you just burn out, you know, cause people think like, oh, I was by my microphone and hit record. Mm. And this is uh this is the, the whole even the podcast aspect of my entire organization is is takes up a lot of my time, which I'm okay with. I it's something I love. But yeah, you know, for me being in this space, um, I think it really started with my childhood. And I'm happy to give any detail that you want, but my childhood was a a bit crazy, a bit unique. And usually when I tell the story, you know, some eyebrows come up of like, wow, like that's I don't know if I've ever heard a story quite like that. So um my mom and biological father got married like really young, like 20, 21 years old. They were like kids, right? And they were married for four years and then they had me. And then right after I was born in 1999, <laughs> I'm kidding, in, uh, in 1975, I uh, do the math, I'm 30, you know, my dad left. Uh, it was a really bitter divorce. And to be honest, Cam, I don't know all of the, I don't know all the details and I don't know if I really care to know. I just know that there was a lot of, you know, gut-wrenching things that probably happened and they were young and whatever, but he left and I didn't know him and I have no recollection of him. And I remember being four years old, being in preschool. And I remember men coming to pick up their kids. And I remember I knew what a dad was, but I knew I didn't have one. And I, there was no pity, no nothing like that. I was like, oh, I was just, my mom hadn't found my dad yet. Cause in my mind, like moms go out and find him. And dude, I'll never forget, man. My mom told me one day, she's like, Hey, uh, uh so I'm, I'm having a friend over for dinner tonight. He's a very special friend of mine. I'd really like for you to meet him. And I was like, he, and she's like, yeah, his name is Joe. And I'm like, and in my mind, I didn't say it out loud. I was like, Oh my God, she found him. She found my dad. Right. Yeah. So I was like, this, this is the guy. Right. So I'll never forget this guy walking in my house for the very first time. You know, he had a trench coat on a three piece suit, a double Windsor tie. He had a mustache, the feathered hair, 1979. And I'll never forget, like looking at this guy, you know, looking up at him and it was the first time a man walked in my house. I was like, it was, it was a feeling man that I still remember to this day. And I was like, Whoa, that's, that's surreal. Right. And I shook his hand and the very first words out of my mouth was, are you going to be my dad? And I think this guy was like, what in God's name did I just walk into? Right. Yeah. So lo and behold, though, they did get married. I think my mom kind of really took that as a Jerry Maguire sign when it, when uh, Renee Zellweger's little kid, um, you know, hugged Jerry Maguire. And she's like, oh my God, like, I just, I got to complete this family. And I think that was my mom's motivation. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy, ex-military, um, very disciplinary, but also heavy drinker and also a very heavy hand. He drank a lot. It was very abusive when he drank, but when he was sober, he was very kind. And it was a very, it was a yin and yang. You never really knew who you were going to get, Jekyll or Hyde. Well, then my mom and him would fight a lot and drink a lot. And it just became like a really explosive, abusive relationship over time. Cops were called to my house a few times by the neighbors. You know, I remember being choked and punched and dragged and hit and, you know, all these things. And I don't share that out of pity. I just share that out of context. And so I was like, wow, this is okay. But back then, you know, 
it actually wasn't too uncommon to be, you know, beat down by your dad. <laughs> my best friend like was, you know, swatted in the face all the time by his dad. So like back then you're just like, oh, this is how we're raised. But uh, they got divorced when I was 10. And there was a part of me, man, that I was very relieved. I was like, oh, thank God he's gone. And there was also a part of me that was like, wow, this really sucks. I don't have a dad anymore. All my friends had dads and I didn't. And um, he was gone. I have, I've never seen him since. And um, when I was 12, something really surreal happened because I started asking a lot of questions like, wait a second, where did I come from? I now know about the birds and the bees. My mom told me, she's like, actually, I was married before. And I was like, wait, what? She's like, I was married before, you know, you have another dad out there. And I was like, no way. I was, I had no idea. And so she showed me wedding pictures of him. And I was like, holy crap, this is crazy. Like, I had no idea. And I was like, well, where is he? Like, and she was like, I don't know. So lo and behold, when I was 12, and I won't go into the detail of it just for time, but I met him and it was not on purpose. It was by accident. And, um, but I met him and dude, I remember being so happy. I remember the day that I got to meet him. It was all organized and all that. I dressed up in a suit. I was 12 years old and I immediately started calling him dad. And it was like, oh my gosh, like I found him. Like he's here. This is amazing. Right. He was remarried, two-year-old son, another one on the way. We hung out for like a five, five good months where I saw him every week. He came to my Little League games, spent time together. And then it was like right around month five. All of a sudden, his just body language and tone and just everything just started to change. And it was almost like he was distancing himself. And I just felt like I was kind of like annoying him and didn't really know where I stood. And the best way I can describe it now that I'm adult is imagine a woman that you've dated in the past and she's not into you anymore, but she hasn't told you yet. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And, but you knew he was coming. So I'll never forget getting on a phone with phone call with him when I was 12, I picked up a phone, called him. I'm like, Hey man, I was like, there he is. Um, hang on one second. <laughs> my wife is at an appointment. So my nine-year-old just came in here. He just woke up with a amazing. I know. I like how that pillow combed your hair. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so I, I reached out to him one day and I was like, you know, Hey man, like what's going on? Like, I just kind of feel like something's up and Basically, I don't even remember the words, man. I just remember the result. And the result mm -hmm. was, it's me, it's not you. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck just happened? Did I just, did he just leave again? And that's what happened. And I went into just an absolute spiraled hole, I think, of depression. You know, I was I over eight. I was a fat kid. I, dude, I failed the eighth grade, like failed. I had to do eighth grade twice. Just I was just like, screw it. I'm done with school. Like I just done repeated eighth grade, went to high school, went to college, graduated, married my, married my college sweetheart, got a great job. So I ended up turning my life around. Um, but at 30 years old, I I've been married for now three years, first son on the way, sitting in a Starbucks for a business meeting and who came walking in to get his morning coffee, but 18 years later, but my dad, and I knew exactly who he was when he walked in, knew exactly who he was. And I was like, holy crap. And then there was a woman who was on my my sales team that I was, that me and Jessica were friends with her and her husband. So we hung out and shared personal time. So she knew my story mm -hmm. and she looked at me and she's like, Hey, hello, are you still here? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was like, um, my, my dad just walked in here to get his morning coffee. And she's like, I'm sorry, what? And, and I, she's like, yeah, I was like my dad. And she's like, where is he? And I was like, right there. And she's like, what are you going to say to him? I was like, there's nothing I'm going to say to that guy, like nothing. Yeah, and she took it upon, yeah, she took it upon herself to go over and talk to him. And dude, I felt like time stood still. Like I'm over there, I'm looking at them talking. And I was like, oh my God, because she didn't even tell me she's going to do it. She's got up and walked over there and did it. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, what is she doing? I was like, do I run? Do I leave? Do I go to the bathroom. He looked at me, I looked at him. And when you see your dad that you haven't seen in 18 years, like make eye contact and you're like, holy crap, what's about to happen? Got up, came over, shook my hand. And he's like, how are you? Hey, man. He's like, Hey man, like, Hey, how are you? And I'm like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> how are you? And I make him sound like a bum. He's actually an incredibly successful entrepreneur. He's still married to the same woman. They've been married for 45 plus years. Now I have two younger half brothers, but that meeting turned into now 17 years of us having, I would say a friendship. He's my, he's my dad. I don't call him dad, yeah. but you know, we, we spend time together. Yeah. Um, but dad edge really stemmed out of really trying to figure out this whole game of fatherhood and being a husband. Mm. And when I first started, I had a laundry list of things I wasn't going to do, right? I'm not going to be abusive. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to hit my kids. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do it. Well, what I, can, what I can tell you is 
having a list of the things you're not going to replicate is not nearly enough of a map. It's almost like going to Home Depot and you buy the new barbecue pit and you open up the manual. I've never seen a manual that says, here's 100 ways not to put this together. Otherwise, yeah, don't do out. this. Yeah. yeah. But that's how it started, man. I know that that was long, but I figured I'd give you some context. No, that's good, man. I listened to your story and I just think of this little boy full of hope every time he sees a guy step in, you know, yeah. that, that, that first guy comes in, you say, are you, my, are you my new dad? And there's this hope you had in your heart. And then you meet your biological father when you're 12, <clears throat> excuse me. And that, that hope I get emotional, man. <clears throat> I get emotional listening to your story, Larry, because I, I see this. You know, I, I've shared a little bit of my background and my background's in education and I've worked at all levels, elementary school, middle school, high school. It doesn't change, man. I see yeah. these, these broken boys. I see these boys who have hope in their heart and then they're hurt by a man. Yeah. And, and it does some, some sad stuff. But then I hear, here you are in your Starbucks and our coffee shop and you see, yeah. and then, then that hope is now replaced with this tentative feeling of like, oh man, what's next? Do I hide here? And yeah. how that transition in, in your heart and in your mind went like, well, here's a guy that I know is my, my father. I don't want to interact with him. Where has he been? Like, what is this going on? So, sure. man, so many amazing interactions in your life that have shaped you to who you are today and shaped you into the dad you are today. So, man, I got to hand it to you. Like, you've done some pretty oh, amazing you. stuff. Saw that little you. man who just walked into your office a few minutes ago. And the first thing he did is he came up to his dad. He put his arm around his waist. And he's just like, he just needs that comfort. And so you've set this bar. That's who you are. So yeah, I got to hand it to you, man. It's amazing stuff. Thank I appreciate you. that, man. If, if I could speak to that just a little bit, it hasn't yeah. been in the absence of falling on my face over and over and over again with mistakes. Right. I imagine. Yeah. Um, I mean, dude, I, it, it's, you, it's, <laughs> imposter syndrome is so high over here at times. It's almost like if you're in the fitness space and you're on a coaching call with your clients and you're eating cupcakes, yeah, man, you shouldn't eat this. Yum, 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 yeah, yeah. Right? You yeah. know what I mean? But it's like, but at the same time, I also know I'm a human being, but you know, I, my two older boys, cause I have four boys, there's almost 17, uh, 15, nine and seven. And my, and my older boys have asked me a lot of questions, that, you know, to date about my childhood. And I just tell them, and I tell them in this very, um, empowering sort of confident masculine way of like, yeah, this happened. All these things happened, right? There was a revolving door of toxic men. My mom was married three times total and just a revolving door of guys who are toxic party or abusive men. And they're like, and I'll get this. Oh my God, I feel so sorry for you. And my response is don't, I don't, no. don't waste any time feeling sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. Don't you either. I was like, because here's the thing. If I would have had this comfy, cozy, nice little warm, like childhood, maybe I wouldn't have been a very good father. Like this propelled me and motivated me to live the life I didn't have growing up. So like, dude, don't, don't spend one minute feeling sorry for your old me. man because your old man doesn't either. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. And that, I think that's what I, I wanted to ask you next was like, in what ways did your own experiences with your biological father and your stepfather um, lead you to form an expanded community like the dad edge? It was by total accident. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was by total accident, you know, so I, I, I'll start with the dad edge, right? So I was at the time I started good dad project. It was right. It was 2012. And dude, it again, came from a horrible dark time. Listen, I was so motivated to not repeat what I grew up with. So like my mom was married three times. There were living boyfriends. There were dudes that were in and out constantly. As soon as you get used to one, another one would, would leave and the other one would enter. Right. And, but so I knew like, okay, I want to be married one time. So I, I want to find the woman that I'm going to be married to one time. And hopefully that's it. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to be married. Um, I was with my wife for seven years before we, <laughs> before we got married. And then we're celebrating 20 years this year. And that hasn't come that's without falling on my face, mm -hmm. you know, over and over. But, um, what I'll share with you is, is the dad edge, good dad project started because my 15 year old was four at the time. I had probably spent my first six years of being a dad, just, I would say it was good, but also completely floundering and frustrated. And I wasn't great with patience and wasn't great with patience with myself. I was a terrible communicator within my marriage. And I just had so much shame of like, God bless. I want to do this so well. Like, why am I not doing it well? And it just, 
it erupted one night and I always swore to myself, I'm not going to hit my kids out of anger. And my four-year-old who's 15 now stepped out of line as any four-year-old would one night. And I spanked him and I spanked him so hard. Unfortunately, he hit the ground and that was hard. And I remember that. And I remember helping him up off the floor because I hit him and he lost his footing and he toppled over. And I was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? So whether you believe in spanking or not, some guys are on board with that. I was not. And I didn't, I make it sound like I hit him hard. I didn't hit him that hard, but I hit him hard enough to where he lost his footing and fell. And I went to pick him up, man. And he looked at me like I was a freaking monster. And that's when I knew I, I something had to change because I knew everything, everything outside, outside of fitness in my career was crumbling. Fitness was great. Career was great. But here's the thing. This is, this is the epiphany that I had that night. I went into my office, dude, I'm crying. I'm like, what is going on with me? Yeah. Like, why can't I do this? Right. And I really started looking at my life. I'm like, I'm like, man, what, what are you good at? Right. Well, I'm good at my job. I'm good at my job because I had a four-year degree in that industry and I was trained for four years. And then I had, you know, 12 weeks of training before I did that job. I did martial arts at the time. I was doing martial arts for 10 years and I was like, I'm pretty good at martial arts. Well, why? I'm good at martial arts because I'm a part of a community. I'm a part of a school. I have an instructor. I practice. I learn. I show up curious as a student. I'm starting to thinking like, what if I learned about being married? What if I learned about being a dad? Uh, goose egg. Nothing. And I was like, well, holy crap, is is it really that simple? Is it really the fact that I just haven't learned the skills and I'm winging it? And the answer that came back was, yeah, that is the answer. So I just went on this learning journey. And to answer your question about community, you and I have, have the same mentor and that's Aaron Walker. So the very first time I was ever exposed to a community was Aaron Walker and ISI, Iron Sharpens Iron. I had no clue what a mastermind even was. And Aaron walked, you know, it is kind of funny that you'll, you'll appreciate this. So when I, Aaron Walker, I had him on the podcast, we, we started this friendship and then he's like, you really need to join a mastermind. And I was like, what's a mastermind? And he told me about the community of like-minded individuals at ISI. And I was like, well, what do we, what do you guys do? He's like, we help each other hold ourselves to higher standards, hold each other accountable, you know, point each other in the right direction, learn new things, you know, and, and go out and do the things we were meant to do, you know, in, in the eyes of, of God. Right. And I was like, sounds cool. I was like, how much is it? And he's like, it's $500. I have one spot open on a Monday morning call team. If you want it. I was like $500. And this was my mentality of growth and investing in myself. And he's yeah. like, he's like, yeah. And an hour of your time. And I'm like, I don't have $500 that, that costs too much. That's, that was my response. Yeah. And he goes, that's fair. He goes, you know what? He goes, can I, can I offer you just a different way to look at this? And he goes, and I don't care which way you go. I, I do care because I care about you. He's like, but I'm not selling you on this. He, he goes, but here's what I'll tell you. He said, Larry, you have an opportunity here with good dad project to really take it into, you know, an entire different universe. Right. And, and do it Right. Yeah. Or you can continue to wing it. And he said, you know, if you come and do life with us, you'll get that direction, but it's going to cost you $500 a month. And it's going to cost you an hour of your time minimum per week. He goes, and there's a cost to doing nothing. And I was like, what, what do you mean by that? And he's like, here's what I mean by that. He goes, for a moment, I want you to think about your life 12 months from today mm -hmm. and where good dad project is going to be, where your marriage is going to be, where you're going to be as a father and a husband and all these things. And if you don't do it right, where are you going to be? And if you do nothing, where are you going to be? What is, what's the cost of that? What's the cost of that life, Larry? And I was just like, oh my God, I never really thought of that. And he goes, call me back in 24 hours with your answer. I think I called him back in 11 minutes. Yeah. And I said, I'm in. And he goes, I was hoping you'd say that. So I started and I loved it. And so much so that I remember having a conversation with Aaron you know, and I was kind of confused at the time because I was very young in my personal growth. And I was like, Aaron, I was like, I don't, I don't really know if I'm getting a whole lot out of this. He goes, yeah, you are. I was like, I don't know if I am. He goes, Larry, I think I was a member for like six months. He goes, I was really hoping you, this would click early, but it hasn't. He goes, have you thought about doing what we do at ISI, but just doing it for dads? And I was like, 
no. And he goes, I was hoping you'd catch on to that one in like the first few months, but you haven't yet. He's like, yeah. why don't you go do that? So, and how Dad Edge Alliance and our mastermind started is I remember reaching out to 12 friends. I said, hey, I have this idea. 12 week mastermind. Here's what it looks like to learn these skills. And I, I formulated all the curriculum. You want to try it? All 12 men said yes. And to experience the growth with all of those men and me for that first 12 weeks, I was like, holy crap, this is unreal. And then, and then here's the, I'll, I'll end with this. After that very first 12 weeks, because at the time, Dad Edge Mastermind was just a 12-week program. Now it's ongoing. But all these guys were like, well, now what do I do? Next. And I'm like, I, I don't have anything for you. Yeah. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, it's a 12-week program, man. Like, we're done. He's like, and dude, this is what happened. They're like, well, can I just do it again? Yeah. And I had an 80% re-sign up rate for another three months. And I was like, it's the same <laughs> stuff. And they're like, we don't care. Yeah. So it was cool. Yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. I didn't know that part of your story. Um, similar reactions to my conversations with Big A myself and his challenges to me. So it's cool that we found ourselves kind of in the, in that same type of environment. So thanks for sharing that. that that's that's yeah. cool. That's the same challenge Big A had for me. That's actually where over the last, you know, year and a half of my involvement in that group with big A yeah. and those men, that's where dad's making a difference. The idea for that. Yeah. So it's very cool that, uh, to hear that perspective from you. Um, Larry, you, you mentioned Jessica earlier in your story, and I don't want to skip over this because I know this is an area of passion for you. You speak very, yeah, very passionately about marriage, about fatherhood. Um, you and Jessica, you were, you were together seven years, you said, before you got yeah. married. Kim and yeah. I were together eight. And, and, and you, know right. what came, you know what it came down to for me? My mom. And my mom passed away in 2015. The listeners to this, I've shared my story uh, lots on my podcast. But my mom pulled me aside. She said, you, if you love this girl, you either got to let her go or you got to make a decision. Wow. Yeah, you're right, mom. <laughs> you're right, mom. And so Kim and I got married. Uh yeah. And we've been together now 12 years, but it's similar. We had those long engagement, long dating periods. So you and Jessica have been together for a long time. Congratulations on coming up on seven, on 20 years of, of marriage. That's exciting. To what extent has Jessica inspired your journey? Well, first of all, Dad Edge wouldn't be here without Jessica. Mm. There's, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. That woman is so graceful, so forgiving, um, and just such a wonderful human being. And she, I'll never forget, you know, just as your mom had a heart to heart with you, right? I'll never forget after that moment where I, you know, I spanked Mason and I, and she, luckily Jessica knows like my heart, right? Uh, Jessica and I recently just got into the, um, the movie, the chosen, or I'm sorry, the series, the chosen, right? And there's this part, right? Where Simon, who's one of the apostles and he's married to this, you know, beautiful woman named Eden, Right. And Simon is going through all kinds of self-sabotaging things. Like he's just, he's not operating at the highest level. He's gambling, he's doing wrong things, but he's desperate, right? To make things right. And Eden always, you know, the reason she's with him is because she knows who he is at the core of who he is, no matter how he's operating in that, in that season or cycle of his life, right? She, she believes in him. And we were watching this the, just the other last night. And my wife was like, I remember having a similar conversation with you. Cause we were watching how Eden was like, you know, you're the reason your life is where it's at is because of this, this, and this, and I know you're, you're better than this. Right. Yeah. And I'll never forget after that moment, when I was really upset about what happened with Mason and she looked at me and she goes, you know what, I'm going to give you some tough love. You know what you did. I, I know you're not proud of it, but you have the potential to be an unbelievable husband and father. And I know it's in you. I know it is. I wouldn't have married you if it wasn't. She goes, but you are not allowing yourself to step into growing into that. You are stagnated by your ego, which you keep telling yourself you should know how to do this. And if you don't, you're weak. That's what's keeping you from all of this, in my opinion. And I was, and I never heard it like that. And I was like, so here's one of the interesting thing about Good Dad Project. I haven't shared this story very, very often. 
for those of you guys who don't know who Sean Stevenson is, he's, he is the host of the Model Health Show. Mm-hmm. I met Sean back in 2011-ish, 12. I, I hired him as a nutrition coach um, before he was the Sean Stevenson he is today, right? Sean was just kind of getting big at the time. Only had like 30 episodes of his podcast at the time. Lived here in St. Louis. And he and I had insanely similar background stories and we really hit it off. And so we became really good friends. And then... Um, I'll never forget. I told him about good dad projects at the time. It was like a Facebook group and it was like a side, like therapeutic thing. And he's like, dude, he's like, that's amazing. You should do something with that. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. So like, you should build a website. You should do this. And I was like, I have no idea what that even looks like. None of it. Right. So Sean goes, well, I do. And at the time, Sean, you know, that his stick was health, but he also knew how to grow a brand. And he's like, I could put it together a proposal and I could help you do this if you want. I could help you. You've got the ideas, you got the vision, but I'll help you with website design and I'll help you with, you know, a podcast if you want to get started and that kind of thing. And I was like, okay, yeah, sounds good. So he's like, come in next week and I'll, I'll present the proposal. I was like, okay. So I was, I was expecting like $500, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. whatever. He slide. it's him and his wife on one side of the table, me and Jessica on the other. And at the time, you know, we're paying off student loans, you know, I was making pretty good money, but it wasn't to support what the proposal was. So he slides this proposal over. It's a six month proposal to basically help me build a website and a brand. $12,935. And I was like, I just slid it right back over. And I was like, I'll think about it. And, and I, I thought I was actually doing what was in the best interest of what Jessica wanted me to do. And I'll never forget. She put her hand on mine Yeah, and she goes, and I go, what? what? And she looks at me and she goes, you should think about this. And I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, if anyone's going to not be on board with this, it's going to be her. I was like, what? And she goes, you should think about this. And I was like, think about what? She goes, I think you should do it. And I was like, Jessica, I was like, we don't have $13,000 just sitting around. We're still in all this debt. She goes, I know. I'll never forget this, man. This is where maybe it's, maybe it's a God thing. She goes, I'll never forget this. She goes, I believe in you. And if you don't do this now, you're never going to do it. So do it. And I was like, I was like, I I wanted to make sure that I wasn't like making this up in my head. I was like, you realize this is $13,000 that we really don't even have. She goes, I know. So make it great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it great. Make it great. And I'll tell you, um, Jessica and I were just going over like the impact that good dad slash dad edge has made. And I, I've been doing this now full time. Never thought I was going to do a full time. And I was like, God bless. Do you remember when, how terrifying it was, you know, 10 years ago that that proposal was slid across the table. And I was like, I couldn't imagine what life would look like right now. Had we not, I was like, to be honest, man, I'd have two boys, not four. I'd be divorced. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be miserable in a high paying full-time job, paying a crap ton of alimony. And my boys probably wouldn't like me much that when you think about the costs, right. And it goes back to Aaron Walker, the cost yeah. that would have been the price tag I would have paid. And when you frame it that way, and there's guys listening to this right now who are being presented with, Maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe it's a, a chance to change. Maybe it's a, a risk that they view it as a risk, but their wife is telling them like, go for it. Like we yeah. need to do this yeah. T- to look through the filter of what is this going to cost if you don't do it? Yeah. And we don't often do that. You know, we have similar stories, you know, going back to like starting businesses and starting a mission or a vision of what you want to do. And it's like, oh, that's scary. But sometimes we're chased away by what we don't know. Yeah. And one of my leadership mentors has shared with me, there's great power in not knowing and to lean into that. I agree. You want to hear something really funny too? Um, and this is this is the mentality. I'll share this with you. So we have two different programs. We have Dad Edge Alliance, which mm-hmm. is, that's like for our nine to five guys, you know, like I would say you're typical, just hungry, eager to learn dads. You know, they've got a career, they work for a, a nine to five, you know, just your typical guy, right? Just hungry to learn. And, and that's what we do in the Alliance. And we also have Dad Edge Accelerator, which is much like ISI, right? It's for our Dad Edge business owners. That one's a little different. You know, that one's a lot more depth to it because business owners just have a different mindset. I had a discovery call 
that a guy scheduled with me yesterday. I think this will really ring true of what you just said about the cost thing, right? And this guy, uber successful financial planner, $150 million book book of business, pays himself a nice healthy salary of 400 grand per year. He's got in a blended family, four total kids and very great. He's in, insane with business. And you could kind of tell he was like, like had some swagger about him with his business, yeah. his marriage communication. I was like, tell me about some interactions you've had with you know your wife. What, what do you want to improve? He's like, I want to improve my communication connection and conflict resolution. I was like, well, give me an example of what you're talking about. He's like, well, this scenario happened. It really pissed me off. He goes, so I just completely distanced myself from her for two straight days. I didn't speak to her. And then when she came and talked to me, I just told her bluntly what was going on, blah, blah, blah. And you did this and you did that. And I was like, okay. I was like, how did that land? And he goes, well, it landed terrible. We fought. I was like, okay. I was like, well, tell me about the kids. He's like, well, he, I was like, where do you think your kids are with the relationship they have with you? He's like, well, I, I think they know I love them unconditionally. I, I think they know I have their best interests as hard. I think that it was a lot of, I think there was a lot yeah. of uncertainty, right? He could not tell me with certainty that what was going on. And I, I said, when your kids come to you with anything, how do you respond? He goes, and literally he was as clear as day. I respond two different ways. I was like, okay, what are they? He goes, I either tell them how to fix their problem or I tell them to stop whining about it. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah. And I go, um, I was like, listen, man. <laughs> and I, I just loved on the guy, you know, cause I was, that was me, right. That was totally me. I felt like I was talking to myself like 10 years ago. I was like, listen, man, I used to handle stuff like that too. I was like, um, you do these things because you love your kids, right? You right. want to fix their problems. You also want to be like, Hey, don't worry about this small stuff. I was like, your kids have three basic needs to feel seen, heard, and safe. I was like, when you fix their problems or tell them that their feelings aren't valid, you do the exact opposite of fulfilling those needs. They don't feel seen. They don't feel heard. And they sure as hell don't feel safe. They are actually computing in their mind. Dad is not the guy I go to. Yeah. He's like, really? I was like, really? I was like, your wife, same thing, seen, heard, and safe. So when you talk to her like that, you're actually pouring kerosene on the fire. You think you're, we think that it's like, oh, I think if I operate this way, this is how it'll land. That's actually not true. Yeah. How it's landing is the opposite of what you're trying to do. So I gave him an, an example of some skills, like conversational excellence that we do in skills and that kind of thing. And I was like, you need to use, um, you know, tactical empathy with using labels. You need to use generative questions, create an environment of psychological safety. And he was like, what? I was like, these are skills that we teach. I know it sounds foreign now, but trust me when I say, this is what you need to do. Yeah. I, and I said, listen, um, what's preventing you from, you know, actually taking action? Cause I could tell he was like waffling on whether or not it was the right fit for him. And then it came out. He goes, well, he goes, I have a lot of fears. He goes, I have a fear of opening up to other men. I don't want to let people know about my problems. And I have a fear of asking for help. And I looked at Adam and I put my pen down and I go, our, our group is not for you then. Yeah. And he's like, what? And I go, this group is not for you. I was like, we will, we require three things, non-negotiable. Number one, you share your wins. When you share your wins, that's actually a contribution to all of us. Cause if you're elevating the communication with your wife and you're not telling us how you're doing it, you're, you need to tell us how you're doing it. Cause we can all benefit from it. I was like, the other thing in is lean in and ask for help when you need it. You have to do that. If you're not willing to do that, we're not the group for you. I was like, and the second thing is be open, authentic, and vulnerable. If you're not willing to do that, this is not the group for you. And then we finally got to the root of like, what's the cost, right? It came all down to fear. fear well, it, well, what if I fail? What if I do that? What if I, what if I try these things and I, and I fail? What if I try to communicate with my wife and it fails? What if I try to connect with my kid and it fails? I was like, you're asking the wrong questions. I was like, listen, man, nobody goes to their grave with a smile on their face going, I'm so glad I never learned skills to connect with my wife. No one. I was like, and we sure don't do that with our kids. I was like, what I want you to think about, man, is the own fears that you have in your head and what that is costing you. Not if I do these things. I was like, literally your freedom is on the other side of this discomfort. Everything that you possibly want, everything that you're articulating to me, it's on the other side of you stepping into it and saying, I don't know the answers, no. but I'm willing to learn and try. And I think that that's a, that's a mindset that a lot of men have. And what I encourage men, whether it's your program, whether it's my program, I don't, whether it's a program you do at church, I don't care. Just get the support you need. But that mentality and that fear and that ego, that's actually the thing that's going to keep you from what you want most. 
And we don't understand that until we're in community like that. That's so true. So many men are held back because they're afraid of growth. You know, in, in the DMD, that's what I just like, we're just committed to your growth. That's what we want you to grow. And we have six areas that to grow in, but you can't grow unless you're going through discomfort, right? That's yeah. when we grow. We, you know, you've trained lots. Your body doesn't grow unless you put it through discomfort and you tear apart muscle fibers so that they can, re, you know, reconnect and get stronger. And we do these things. Um, you think about your marriage. I think about my marriage. You know, our marriages don't get stronger unless we have to navigate some hard things together. Right. And when you navigate those hard things together and you begin to actually connect with the other person, as opposed to the approach that 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 gentleman shared with you, you start to grow, you start to strengthen things. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. As when you speak to marriage again, what ener- like what do you do to energize your marriage? Because I think about this guy's story that he, he shared with you and you're like, man, like how did that land? Right. We all find ourselves in those spaces. We do sometimes. And then the key is like, what do you do when you find yourself in that space and then you shift out of it and you energize your marriage instead of hurt your marriage? What do you do in your marriage with Jessica to energize that relationship? Yeah. So it's going to sound oversimplified, but to be quite honest, we overcomplicate it. And I I think the first step, honestly, Cam, is we just have to realize what the differences are with men and women and how we communicate that. I mean, and once you understand those differences, then you're like, Oh, so I'll give you an example, right? Cam man to man. Right. So if I come to you, right. Which by the way, if I come to you with a, with something I want advisement on, it takes a lot of bravery for me to do that. Number one, I have to get real and authentic and vulnerable with you. And we can do that in a very masculine way. And we can also do it like in this estrogenic, you know, nasty feminine feel of it too. It's like, Oh my God, man. Like, can you tell me how to communicate with my wife? Right. Yeah. No one likes that. No. But if I come to you and I say, Cam, I want to talk to you about something, man. I've noticed that you and your wife seem to have this really good relationship. And to be quite honest, man, me and Jessica, we're not talking as much as I'd like, we're not having sex as much as I'd like. We're not, we're not connecting. I, I, I don't know what to do, or I don't know what to do. Yeah. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm sharing an issue with you. I'm sharing a problem, right. Or I'm sharing something. Now it's one thing to validate my feelings. Like, yeah, man, that sounds hard. And then there's this awkward pause between man to man of like, yeah, it's hard, dude. What do you think I should do about it? Would you please tell me? I'm asking you, I wouldn't waste your time or my breath if, unless I was like, can you please give me a point in the right direction? Otherwise, like, if you're just going to be like, yeah, it's hard. Uh, I, I need more. Right. Yeah. So I think you have to understand that's how men talk. Now, how mm-hmm. women talk is they need to feel seen, heard, and safe. Men need to feel respected, appreciated, validated. So there's three different needs. So when your woman comes and talks to you about maybe it's a problem, maybe it's a stressor, maybe it's an overwhelm, right? She's not looking for, let me say this twice. She's not looking for you to solve the problem. She is not looking for you to solve the problem, at least 80% of the time. Okay. 20% of the time. Sure. 80%. No. What she's really after and guys, listen up what she's really after when your wife is talking to you about something that's overwhelming her, she is looking for one word and that is connection, Mm -hmm. connection. And the guys are like, well, what's connection? Connection is seeing her, hearing her, and making her feel safe. So this is, if you haven't watched the YouTube video that's hysterical, it's not about the nail, go YouTube it. It's hilarious. It's been on YouTube for 10 years. The funny thing is, is the female who plays the female actress in that, she's now a huge star. She was Phoenix and Maverick. But this this YouTube video goes back 10 years before she was popular. So anyway, um, when your wife comes to you and wants that connection, what she really needs is to be emotionally labeled, Right. That sounds overwhelming. Who wouldn't be overwhelmed? Tell me more about that. Yeah. And then you're just allowing her space, right? Your wife is going to feel so unbelievably connected to you, especially if you're reflecting back and you're validating and all these things and you're welcoming more information versus like, well, you should do this and you should do that. And you should do this. Cam, before I knew that, that very, very simple skill, this is what I used to tell my wife. I, I I'm shocked. She never slapped me upside the head. I would give my wife all my, all my beautiful wisdom and advice like 10, 15 years ago. Right. And then I'd get pissed when she would not take it. I actually told my wife this on several occasions. If you don't want my advice, don't come and talk to me. Don't ask for it. Right. I I was just, I know she's like, I I literally think back to that. I'm like, Oh my God, 
Like, how did she not like slap me upside the head now that I know that? So knowing that, that that's what she actually needs. And that's the differences between our, us, me as a man and her as a woman and how I can lead her and connect with her. That's made a huge difference. So it's, it's just understanding number one, our communication style. So that's number one. Number two is this, you've got to understand her love language and she's got to understand yours. 70 plus percent of married couples don't know their spouse's love language, let alone their own. So once you understand there's five, right? There's physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service and gifts. Once you understand the keys to your wife's heart and you love her very specifically in those ways, and she does the same for you, that's what makes a good, that's another element. And what most people do, like I'm physical touch and words of affirmation. So I'll touch my wife, kiss my wife, hug my wife, sex, and just tell her how beautiful she is all the time. But you know what? As much as she appreciates that to some degree, what she really appreciates is when I do dishes. Or when I take her out on a date and spend quality time and acts of service, right? That's how she feels most loved. And I feel, and she knows I feel most loved when she puts her hands on me or compliments me. So most people have to override that default because we automatically want to default and love somebody in the love language that we need most. And what most people don't realize is that um, that's what we're doing. And then we're, we get frustrated and resentful of like, why is this not? why is this not working? I'm doing all this work and I'm loving her and whatever. And I'm loving him is not working. That's why that's one of the reasons. Wow. You're sharing, you know, these conversational pieces that we have with our wives and understanding who they are, where they're coming from and the three filters they have. And there's so many men. I agree with you. There's so many men who don't understand that we have different filters. Yeah. Like we, and you need to be aware of those. And I'm so, yep. guys, if you're listening to this, like Larry teaches this in his program. So, you know, you know where to look. And he's got lots of resources on this. Um, Larry, I have a question for you. you know, right now, as a dad, as a husband, what's an area of growth that you're excited about or you're diving into right now? Oh, man, that's easy. So resilience for me. Okay. Um, you know, I... I'm really keen on, on resilience. And that's because basically being able to have the ability to take on stress and be calm in the chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, I'm one of the, I, I have some strengths and I have a lot of weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is I would say at times I'm very resilient and I can take on the weight of the world. And there are sometimes I just freaking crumble. Usually what happens when I crumble, it's like the death of a thousand cuts. And it's just that last one. I'm like, God bless. Right. I just, it's hard for me to keep going sometimes. So like, for instance, over the past three weeks, we've had some devastating things happen in our lives. So my best friend and one of my partners within dad edge, tragically three weeks ago, his 19 year old daughter was killed in a car accident. Like that has sent a shockwave through his life, you know, our friendship. Cause you're trying to support a friend. Um, you know, I'm overwhelmed with work because we're not allowing him to work right now. He needs time. So we're really picking up the pieces on that. We just had another uh, neighbor of ours, 45 years old, pass away from a brain tumor. She found out back in December, she died in, within eight weeks. Um, crazy things have been happening. And, you know, along with being a dad of four boys and a business owner, um, I had one heck of a day about three and a half weeks, about three weeks ago where I was just, I kind of crumbled and my wife looked at me, I was just kind of short and I wasn't being very resilient and I was kind of crabby and with my kids and my wife looked at me, she goes, why don't you get out of here? Go do something for yourself. And as much as I knew she was doing that from a loving place, she was also like, you're stressing us all out, get out, like go do, and she meant that in a loving way, but like, Hey, go somewhere else, please. And I really started thinking about that resilience piece. And here's what I can tell you what I'm learning and what I'm growing through. I sat down with a client, actually, a guy who's been in the military for 20 plus years, very high level. I can't speak to really all of what he does, but just know he's really, really worked this muscle of resilience. And I asked him, I was like, does anything ever get to you? He's like, not really. And this guy works for the government. You know, he's in the Pentagon. And I was like, how, like how he's like, I don't know, man. He's like so many reps, so many deployments, you know, so much training. He goes, he goes, let me, let me share something with you, Larry. He goes, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I was like, what does that mean? 
And he goes, it means this. When you slow down, things get smoother. And when you're smooth, you can think fast and more efficiently. And I was like, he's like, that's what they share with the special, special forces and the special operators. I was like, well, what, what does that mean? He goes, and this is where, you know, your, your client actually is coaching you and me agging you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, can you give me an example? He goes, sure. He goes, let's take your own life. He goes, what do you do when you're stressed out? So I go to the gym. He goes, exactly. Well, how do you feel when you, when you're in the gym? I was like, I feel better. He goes, why is that? I go, it's because <clears throat> I'm working out. I'm getting that physical release and, you know, I, I feel really good. Right. And, he, you know, I, I work out all the tension. He goes, mm -hmm, yep. But that's not actually what's going on. And I was like, okay, tell me more. And he goes, what's actually happening is, is the reason you feel more calm is because the gym forces you to slow down your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I was like, w w what do you mean? And he goes, well, when you're in the gym, are you thinking about your breathing and your sets and the squats and the bench press and all this? And just, you're in the moment, right? And I was like, yeah, he goes, you're not in your head. You're in whatever it is you're doing. He's like, which is actually slowing down the lightning bolts and the high traffic of all these thoughts that are just bum rushing your brain. He's like, so when you're in the gym, you're actually slowing all that down. And I was like, he goes, <laughs> and this is a special ex special forces guy. He goes, do you know what I do when I'm stressed out? When I'm, when I need some resilience and I go, what? He goes, I bake bread. And I was like, you bake bread. And he's like, yeah, this is a big burly six foot five ex special forces guy. And I'm like, you bake bread. And he goes, yeah. Do you know how patient you have to be to make bread from scratch? He goes, it takes hours. He goes, but when I bake bread, I slow everything down. I can think clearer because slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And as I'm baking bread, I'm able to think clear. I'm able to slow things down. My stress goes down just like you in the gym. Yeah. He goes, so if you ever feel triggered and you need more resilience in the moment, box breathe and remember slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And dude, I have done that ever since he, he gave me that coaching. And it has made a world of difference. Hasn't worked every time because I haven't gotten in the habit of doing it every time, but it has been tremendous for my resilience. Thanks for sharing, Larry. Larry, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Appreciate man. you taking time. I know it's a busy time for you. I love that your boys come in and out while you're doing this. I think that's, you're setting the standard, man. And I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that you're doing. So thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate you, brother.